Yes, I. Greeting once again, not mighty name of his imperial majesty, Emperor Eilis Selassie the first. You know, see it. Yeah. And all things that's good. See? Greetings to all of the wonderful subscribers. Them. You know, see? More blessings to the new subscriber them. See? And if you manage to just watch the channel and you like what you see, you don't know. Subscribe. I make a grow the thing, you know? Because you don't know, you know? It's all about us. The club. <laughs> Enlightenment club. You know, see? Yeah. Yeah. This is the revolution of the mind. Mm -hmm. So we are continuing with the book now. Um, Born for Dead. You know, see, it's a very interesting read. And um, I'm really hoping... You know, because so far, everybody looks like them like it. So we are continuing. I mean, I'll f um, follow up some of the suggestions of the people and suggest. Them say, this is so nice for the music, you know, the background. And the also said, this is so nice of me. Break it down and give my opinion and personal knowledge but <laughs> what I <laughs> what I've read. So I'll do that whenever I can, as honestly as I can. You know, see, so I'm going to continue with chapter two of Born for Dead, the Groundation. See? Yeah. <clears throat> Darkness had already fallen on the September evening in 1984 when I flew across the island into Kingston. After so many years of short visits, I was coming back to my adoptive country to live. Nervous with anticipation, I pressed my forehead against the humming plastic porthole and remembered a prophetic conversation I had had seven years before with John Womack, the professor who would become one of my dissertation advisors. It was the beginning of the fall term and the history department was having its annual reception for a new and continuing graduate student. I had spent that summer in Jamaica, living with an enchanting, hard-drinking hard -drinking Irishman who taught elementary school in Montego Bay and had returned to Cambridge full of a confusion I was coming to know all too well. Jamaica was in a shambles that summer, beset by economic crisis and escalating political violence, and many of the teachers I knew in Montego Bay were quitting their jobs to leave Jamaica for good. A headmaster there had begged me to stay and teach, and the plight of so many school children made me wonder why I was coming back to thrust through an advanced degree. I walked into the history department party alienated by I walked into the history department party party alienated by the unquestioned privilege and power that emanated from the building's neoclassical great space the atrium where we gathered and I caught a glimpse of Warmack standing on the fringes of the crowd he was something of a legend to many of his students the university's only Marxist historian he had written a magisterial biography of the Mexican revolutionary Emilio Zapata and his lectures to which he came wearing jeans and cowboy boots often centered on bitter subjects like the role of torture in Latin American regimes. One of my friends thought he, he resembled Jack Nicholson. He definitely had the same brooding force. I, I barely knew him then except for a reputation but because he had lived in mexico i thought he might understand the disjunction that comes from straddling the abyss between the first world and the third so how is jamaica doing under manly Womack asked and i described the island's trivial along with my own when i was finished he just shook his head if you want me to he said I can paint the scenario for the next 10 years of your life. His unexpected candor was a breach of the unusual decorum that prevailed between faculty members and their anxious, worshipful students. So I held my breath and waited for my fortune to be told. 
You keep going back to Jamaica again and again, Womack said softly, and the place will never be anything else to you than what it is now. A lovely mystery. A loved mystery. But you won't ever be really comfortable here again, either. And eventually, you will become a kind of exile in both places. This was more than I had bargained for. A, a zen whack from the master. How do you know this? I asked. Womack gave me his best Jack Nichols a smile. Mexico, he answered. I never forgot that conversation. It was a prelude to the doctoral wranglings that came later. When I would leave my carrel in the library, exhausted by the melancholy, melancholy, exhausted by the melancholy that comes from too much reading and stopped by Walmart's office for encouragement. But now I had chosen to leave the world with all of its seductive familiarities for the uncertainty he, for the uncertainty he had warned me about years before. And I remembered his words as a kind of valedictation. <clears throat> Peering into the blackness of Jamaica's night sky, I conjured up the landscape below from memories. Beneath us was the grand ridge of the Blue Mountains, 7,000 feet of ferny rainforest blanketed by clouds. The countrymen and had dug terrace cultivations into the mountainside. Steeping steeper than a Mayan pyramid. I thought of them trudging home in the darkness with cutlasses tucked under their arms, wearing giant wool cap sent home by relatives in England or America, and walking in rubber wellingtons with soles caked with red clay. I picture the crops they coaxed from the cultivation, the same ones that had sustained Jamaica for the past 300 years, cassava and yam, Irish and sweet potatoes, dasheen, leafy green callaloo, breadfruit and papaya. I had learned but kept forgetting which of these were indigenous to the island and when had, and which had been brought in, first from West Africa and then from India and the Pacific. The slave ships brought the first aki, the bright orange pod that holds in tender yellow fruit in a tight, poisonous embrace until the pod opens and releases the deadly hypoglycine, making the aki safe to eat. The breadfruit came in with Captain Bly on the bounty from Tahiti. All of those foodstuffs came and all of those foodstuffs came and went across the ocean in the same imperial commerce that brought the slaves. Shiva, Nepal's novel, a hot country lay open on my lap. His vision of the West Indies was like his brother's. It swerved by, between pity and contempt. I had put the book down after we I had put the book down after we crossed Cuba and I read. The history of this patch of earth, earth was written in blood. Pain was the only thing that had flourished on its red side. Only in pain had they been self-sufficient. I had fa fallen, I had fallen to re remembering my first trip to Jamaica, just in time to catch the fever of the 1976 election. By then, the two parties had been kicking back power kicking power back and forth between them like a soccer ball for so long that only older people recalled election without violence. Michael Manley was prime minister, but he was already in deep trouble with his own fractious party and with the United States, and the island was flying with rumors of American plots to destabilize Manley government. Philip Agui, a rogue CIA operative who returned into a, who turned into a whistleblower blowing apostate had come to Jamaica in the fall of 1976 and identified several agents on the island. The American ambassador, Summer Gerard, denied Aggie's allegation, but that did nothing to quell the fear about destabilization. Manley retaliated with a program of socialist discipline that he called heavy manners, and the, th the slogan was scrawled on every wall it was eloquent patois that 
rally Jamaica and to stand firm against the gun terror Edward Siago was unleashing with the JLP. Hoping to stem the rising tide of gang violence that engulfed Kingston, Manley declared a state of emergency in summer of 1976, detaining, locking up 593 people. Some of them were the leaders of the city's most dreaded gang, and others were politicians from both parties who were suspected of being warlords. Manley waited to set a date for the coming election until November when he went to Montego Bay and delivered one of the most charismatic performances of his career. He stood before a crowd of 120,000 ecstatic supporters in St. Charles Square, all of them mindful of the slave from whom the square was named. The man they lovingly called Daddy Shah had led an 1831 uprising of such magnitude that he hastened the day. Three years later, when England freed its slave, All of them mindful of the slave from whom the square was named. The man they lovingly called Daddy Shah had led an 1831 uprising of such magnitude that it hastened the day three years after when England freed its slave. Manly, too, was mindful of Sam Sharp's legacy as he whipped the crowd into a frenzy that blazing afternoon, finally naming December 15 as election day. I watched him from the seashell pink roof of a bank in the square as he brandished the scepter everyone called a rod of correction. The rod was said to have been given to Manly by Ethiopia's Haile Selassie when young Manly visited East Africa in 1970 and by the time of his first victory in 1972 election it had become the PNP's most powerful symbol, symbol of authority and righteousness. The crowd went wild when Manly raised it high. His followers were, call, were calling him Joshua by then. The prophet who would lead them into the promised land. Lick them Joshua, the crowd roared as if with one voice. Lick them with the rod of correction. It was new to the feverish world of Jamaica's leader worship and I had never seen anything like this before. But the young man who was standing beside me on the roof had witnessed many such performances. He explained that to many of the sleepy tourist town whose apartheid beaches had only recently been desegregated by the PNP government, Manley was very like a, Manly was very like a god. At that moment, their leader was proclaiming that socialism held no terror for Jamaica because what socialism really meant was love. Manly swept to victory in December, despite the violence at polling station and some dubious counting of votes. But the rift between the PNP and the JLP only widened after the election. With Siaga leading an intransigent opposition and his momentarily defeated gunmen sitting in their ghetto limbo, licking their wounds and spoiling for revenge. Meanwhile, the island's elite saw Manly's victory as a signal of wars to come, and many of them left Jamaica for good. They had already sent their capital to banks abroad. Manly wasn't exercising any rhetorical restraint either. Soon after the election, he warned the JLP high-ups that if they didn't like the way he was running Jamaica, there were plenty of flights to Miami. My sister and her husband were living that winter with their three daughters in the village of Anchovy near Montego Bay in a house they had rented from a businessman named Lester Bell. Bell was a die-hearted labourite, a labour rank as Manly's people were then calling Siaga supporters. His hilltop mansion was built by workers who earned a dollar a day, toiling up the street the steep grade with hundred pound bags of cement on their heads and Bell treated them like beasts of burden. He claimed to love Jamaica as long as he felt it was his but now he, he, he railed against this damned freeness mentality that the PMP was spreading among the sufferers. His workers were demanding that the new minimum wage of $40 a week 
some of them were sprouting dreadlocks and wearing t-shirts with revolutionary slogans and images of Marcus Garvey over their hearts. There had been a spate of frightening crimes in and around Montego Bay, seemingly aimed at the rich. Lady Sarah Churchill was raped at gunpoint in her cottage at Round Hill, one of the most exclusive resorts in Jamaica, and the attack took on the contours of a political act. Lester Bell and his wife began smuggling their money out to Canada and making plans to leave. The Bells often came out from Montego Bay to check up on us, puttering and fretting on the breeze swept veranda where Mistress Bell kept her treasured orchid. She bustled through the house on unnaturally tiny, tiny size four feet, barking orders at the maid and the gardeners who only hummed softly to themselves as they washed and scrubbed and watered. When we went to town at one evening to have drinks with the bells, their watchdogs growled at the bush sounds at the bush sounds in the back garden and Lester went for the shotgun he kept propped by the door, aiming it into the darkness and cursing with fear. Already sick with a bad heart, he died in Canada a few years later. His farewell to Jamaica was to strip the anchovy house of every wire and fixtures, turning it into a derelict shell so that none of the locals would capture it after he was gone. Capturing unoccupied land and dwelling has always been the sufferer's way of taking back what they think should be theirs to begin with. Years later, my sister and I returned to that house. It was a ruin captured by dampness and rock. The gardens had reverted to jungle and the beautiful mahogany windows and doors were warped before beyond repair. Lizard and mango scuttled through the terrace ground. The only thing left of grandeur was the sweeping view of Montego Bay from the veranda. We remember the nights after the bells had gone to Canada when we threw open the doors of their forbidden palace to our anchovy friends, drinking overproof with the crew from Campbell's rum shop down the hill and getting them to teach us how to play dominoes and dance. My sister and I listened for the echoes of our laughter in the ghostly silence that had settled over the house. Almost a decade had gone by since then, but the Jamaica I remembered from the 70s had changed so much that the days of Michael Manley's heavy manners might have been from another century. Siaga was no prime minister, and Manny, once so vigorous and vocal, was ill with cancer and had gone into a kind of internal exile, a prophet without honor in his own land. In one of his more belligerent moments, Siaga had recently vowed that he and the JLP had the power to lock Jamaica down tighter than a sardine tin. It seems as if he, he, he had kept his promise. All of the political energy of the Mali years had vanished without a trace. <clears throat> Coming into Norman Manly Airport, we circled over a sprawling plane of light that Kingston become at night. I thought about the, the man for whom the airport is named, father to the former prime minister and the leader who midwifed this country into independence in 1969. Thirty years after Norman Manley found the PNP and began the long struggle for nationhood, he lay dying at his home in the Blue Mountain foothills. His wife Edna, an artist and activist who had stood beside him in every political fight, bent down to catch his whisper. He was hallucinating, murmuring that he had a train to catch, but Edna begged him to forget about that train and stay a little longer with the people who loved him. No, Manly answered. Life here costs too much. Those were his last, his last words. The passport officer who rushed through my documents was tired and hot, sweating under the slow twirling fan. There were so many Jamaican arrivals and departures stamped in my passport that he had to smile. When he finally found a work permit from the university, I imagine what he must have been thinking. Jamaicans leave their homeland by the thousands to seek work 
but this foreign woman has found a job on the island between 1980 and 1990. 213,805 Jamaicans came to the United States, 9% of its 2.4 million people. Other countries sent greater numbers, but Jamaica had the highest percentage of population. This massive migration inflicts wounds that bear a strong resemblance to slavery force partings. Children often grow, grow up without ever knowing their mothers, and the pain of separation has become a fixture in the island's soulscape. No one questioned the necessity of this endless sundering. Without the money that workers abroad sent home, their families would perish. So when you go in to teach us, the immigration officer asks playfully, but with an edge to his voice. No, so what you're going to teach us, the immigration asks playfully, but with an edge to his voice. I was relieved to be able to say that it was American history, not that of his own people. He stamped me my allotted time he stopped me my allotted time and i passed through into the echoing customs hall into the echoing customs hall where another sweating officer rifled through my duffel bag in search of contraband and gun my friend nelson from the history department was waiting outside to take me to the new home i hadn't seen yet a small faculty flat on campus but we decided to have a drink first in Port Royal, the old pirate town on the tip of the same sandy peninsula as the airport. We both love Port Royal for the echoes of its past, although the place is nothing but a sleepy fishing village now. In the 17th century, it was the Saddam and Gomorrah of the English Caribbean. Every slave ship bound for the English colonies unloaded some of its surviving passengers at Port Royal. While sea dogs like Francis Drake and Henry Morgan warred in the waterfront brothels. There were so many criminal enterprises that the women had a jail of their own. On a bright June day in, 19, in 1692, an earthquake and tidal wave buried most of the town beneath the sea. Killed 2,000 people and heaving galleons into the streets. A friend had taken me to the graveyard of the little Anglican church in Port Royal, rebuilt after the quake, where one of its miraculous survivors is buried. He was a French Huguenot named Solomon Galdi, a slave trader who was thrown into the sea by the earthquake's first shock and then res rescued by a passing ship. He stood before his grave. We stood before his grave and wondered why he had been spared. The evening cool brought Port Royal's small population out into the street where women set up cursing lanterns and little glass cases full of fried fish and cassava wafers called cassava wafers called bami. Nelson and I brought beers and carried our greasy paper bags of fish to the waterfront, sitting on a beach boat and looking across Kingston Harbour to the city's, city's lights. They flickered like stars in the air currents that wafted over the water. When I went to use the toilet at Gloria's Rum Shop, I noticed that my favorite dirty moral, a tiny woman disappearing, a tiny man disappearing between the mountainous buttocks of a grandly fat woman had been erased from the wall behind the bar. The barmaid told me that some images conscious people from the Prime Minister's office in Kingston had asked that it be painted out. Siaga wanted to develop Port Royal for tourism, and the moral was a little too raw. Sated and mellow, Nelson and I went on to town in the late night hours when the city wears itself out into Lankra. Pedestrians loomed up in the milky clouds of exhaust that make night driving in Jamaica a test of concentration and goats and cows trailing their ropes grazed along the roadside. We sped by the smokestack of the cement company and the Pilbury flour mills and I thought of a gunman named Copper, a Robin Hood from the 1970s who used to rob the mill and distribute flour to the poor and the cow them was Zander cow them. 
and Zander called them they walk up and down on the Rinard Road and come on. You know, see? The Rinard Road turned from an, industrious, from an industrial strip into a Kingston thoroughfare of the con at the corner of Mountain View Avenue, where a cluster of rum shops had their wooden doors open to the sidewalk and night-long domino games were in full swing. Through the open car window came a familiar click and slap of plastic ivory pieces being slid and slammed onto the board tables and the shouts, curses and laughters of the players. Fragrant smoke from jerk chicken stands floated in as well and I got Nelson to stop and let me buy some for tomorrow's lunch. The vendors come out only after dark. Night food, I joked to him as I got back in the car and we both laugh at my intentional misuse of the phrase what it really meant. What it really means in the perfect grammar of Patois is sex. <laughs> the sound from the rum shop droop box were the only thing that had changed. Were the only thing that had changed. They weren't playing reggae anymore and the songs were all rapid fire dance all tune with a lot of gun sounds on the tracks. We heard the real thing after we turned onto Mountain View Avenue and skirted the shanty town that lie at the base of Warwick Island. Spare street like this disappeared up into the dense darkness of bush covered slopes that are the last best refuge of Kingston outlaws. Warwick is part of Long Mountain, which stretches like a lump of wilderness across the city's eastern flank. The western ridge falls away into shanties that are crowned absurdly by a wealthy neighborhood called Beverly Hills, robbed with predictable regularity by Warwickshire gunmen. And the eastern side of the mountain slope down onto the Mona Plain, where the, uni where the university is. Nelson and I listened to gunshots together. They were single shots. Starking, he said. Someone's looking for someone. Looking up at the fortress of that hill, I mentioned copper, and Nelson told a story from his days at the university in the early 70s when student radicals saw Kingston outlaws as revolutionaries. Sometimes gunmen themselves would materialize like phantoms at student union dances. <laughs> but Nelson remembered another appearance, a night when Copper showed up at a medical student's flat with a bullet in his shoulder. Both men were awed by the legend's present and his bravery. Nelson's friend had no anesthetic, but Copper ordered him to cut the bullet out anyway. Just do it, he said, and they did. The city noises evaporated once Nelson and I reached the campus of Mona and the rum shop's soundtracks was replaced by croaking tree frogs and night winds. On a whim, I asked Nelson to drive by another favorite place of mine before we went home, the ruins of the church that once belonged to a visionary preacher named Alexander Bedward. It stood in a grove of architecture just off a sandy lane in Arrowstone, the working class settlement close to campus, and I had often seen the white robed Bedwardite woman walking up the Mona Road to that church on Sunday mornings. When their hymns singing would ring through Arrowstone, when their when their hymn singing would ring through Arrowstone. I wanted to see the church by moonlight and to remember the revivalist shepherd who had prophesied the fall of Jamaica's white aristocracy. He was one in a long succession of apocalyptic souls driven mad by his country's sorrows. No, Bedwell wasn't mad. He never went mad. A Jamaican version of a Sikh ghost dancer. He was their contemporary, in fact. Bedwell started having visions in 1891, long before the authorities locked him up in Bellevue, Kingston Mental Asylum. In a dream, he saw that the black wall shall crush the white wall, and his Baptist followers took his prophecy to heart. So did the police, who jailed him. But Bedward celebrated his release in 1920 by vowing to fly. He would take to the skies on the last day of that year, 
from the branches of one of the attitudes in his Augustone churchyard. He was going home to Africa, and if his flock kept the faith, they would follow him home as well. By the time, by that time, Bedouard's fame had spread to the rest of the English-speaking Caribbean and through the Central American countries where Jamaican laborers had migrated. Many believers came from as far as Panama to watch him fly. When his wings failed to spout, the police locked him up again. This time, as a madman in Kingston, Bellevue Asylum, he died there three. He died there ten years later, but his congregation endured. Nelson and I stopped at the moonlit churchyard. He said it was fitting for us to be remembering Bedouard since that autumn marked the 150th anniversary of emancipation in Jamaica and the founding of Augustown itself by newly freed men and women. The island's post-emancipation history was Nelson's own speciality and he loved to talk about that period, but he was also a witty and scathing observer of the com contemporary scene he'd earned his doctorate at of the contemporary scene. He had earned his doctorate at Oxford and he came home with a repertory of stories about what it had been like to be a brown-skinned Jamaican in the mother country. Yes, I, <laughs> a brown-skinned Jamaican in the mother country. <laughs> That's Britain, you know? Yeah. <laughs> he told them with his best dry humor but they were always about pain. One day when he was working at the British Museum, he queued for a bus and accidentally brushed against a white Londoner in the line. The man promptly swung around and called the Café du Late Nelson, a black bastard. My friend, Nelson replied, not missing a beat, my mother in Jamaica would be her tears to hear you call her lovely brown son black. I was slowly catching on to the torturous complexity of Jamaica's racial consciousness. Although race was high on the country's agenda that fall because of the observance surrounding the 150th anniversary of freedom. These cer ceremonies made a lot of people uncomfortable, mainly the light-skinned few whose ancestors were the master class. I realize that class itself, not color, is one of the safe categories in which Jamaicans frame discussion about the gap between the skin shade, because the overwhelming majority is black. Point blank discourse about race is often too threatening to the fragile order of Jamaica's establishment and its prevailing fiction of a plural society. So the bitter fact that color itself is what most often consigns many Jamaican to poverty is obscured by polite, British-inspired talk about the evils of the class system and the, illu the illusory the ease with which lovers choose partners of a different shade simply mask a deeper racism. These, couple, these couplings are possibly possible not because race is not an issue, but for exactly the opposite reason. The darker partner knows that the child born of a union with a lighter skin lover or spouse will have a better chance in life. Jamaicans have not relinquished their preference for bright skin, good hair, and white featured faces. A few weeks, white features faces. Jamaicans, a lot of Jamaican are mainly concentrated from the Igbo tribe in um, Nigeria. A strong population of Jamaicans. And the Igbo tribe are light skinned people, brown skinned people, like almost like them of our St. Elizabeth. So um, the Igbo people have always got that sort of flair to maintain that thing with them. You can go study their history back there in Nigeria, right at present, right? You know, when you see them culture or them. Flex and fixate. So when come on to the light skin type of thing with some Jamaican, it's not an issue of race of such, but it's kind of a it's kind of a elementary part of them makeup study the history. Yeah.
few weeks after I arrived, there was a car accident in the countryside in which two young people from a wealthy family were killed. I overheard an elderly black woman at a Kingston bus stop lamenting the death with a friend. What a sad thing, eh? She said. And the two of them so nice and white. The Daily Gleaner was meanwhile full of stories about the emancipation celebration. Remembering the decades before when Afrocentricity allowed Jamaicans to begin being proud about having overcome slavery. I was astonished that all of this was once again a source of shame and confusion. Why glorify pain and a heritage of slavery? Asked a white greener columnist in In Australia, they don't celebrate the arrival of criminals and jailbirds shipped by the thousands from the British Isle to colonize. Isles to colonize. Why does Jamaica celebrate slavery? White Jamaicans kept confusing commemoration with celebration. They would prefer to forget, as a black journalist answered, the aim is not to look back in shame and anger, but to reminisce with pride and a sense of having overcome considerable odds. In a downtown museum not too far from where the slave market once was, the Institute of Jamaica had mounted an exhibit on slavery and emancipation. There were log irons, collars and manacles, whips and chains. There was a famous 18th century diagram of how to pack a slave ship, showing the prone bodies laid hip to hip below deck. They were tracked by English anti-slavery agitators written at the beginning of the 19th century, when the trade was already three centuries old. And for a comic relief, there was a satirical cartoon in the manner of Ro Roland and Hoggard about a young, eager Englishman named Johnny Newcomb who was undone by the West Indies. The delicately tin tinted panels told the story of Johnny's rise and fall, how he began as a conscientious planter, riding through the sugarcane field on a handsome horse, but soon began drinking rum and lazying through the long, scorching afternoons with an array of dark-skinned beauties. With an array of dark-skinned beauties. In the end, he lay on his deathbed, reduced to a skeleton by malaria and loss. The centuries unraveled as I walked past the displayed case filled with relics of atrocities and redemption. Then I rounded a corner and almost collided with a contraption that could only have come from a friend's dream, from a fiend's dream. <laughs> it was an iron punishment cage suspended from the ceiling by its headpiece. Rusting hoops formed an exoskeleton for the torso and the legs. Bending close, I saw the iron crutch strap hammered. I saw the iron crutch strap hammered sharp as a knife and the spikes on the foot pads of the stirrup. An artful crafted device, most likely forged by a blacksmith who was himself a slave. A solitary guard heard my camera click and strolled over to gaze at the cage with me. I asked him where the thing had come from and he said that workmen had recently unearthed it while digging a new foundation on an old sugar estate. The university itself was built in the 1940s on land that had once been a plantation and the campus was full of ruins. Old maps of Mona estate showed slave cabins in neat rows among the ackee trees that still grew behind my flat. And a colleague from the history department was leading a student dig under the trees. He took me to the archaeological museum in Port Royal, housed in the barracks of Port Royal, where Royal Navy sailors once convulsed, convulsed from yellow fever. Convulsed from yellow fever. The curator let us 
let us wander through the air conditioned storeroom where uncatalogued artifacts were kept, shelved in cardboard boxes on the ceiling. The one I choose to open happened to be filled of zinis, baseball sized stone carving made by Arawak Indians. I lifted one, a tiny smiling face above crossed arm. We really don't know what these were for, the curator said. The there aren't any Arawaks left to tell us. I described the Zemis to my next class. We were doing early New World history at the time, and the students were savoring the story of Columbus' disastrous sojourn in Jamaica. The Admiral was shipwrecked on the island in 1503 with a mutinous crew of disappointed, angry sailors. They wrapped they raped and plundered through the Arawak settlements until the natives refused to bring them any more food. And then both crew and Indians turned against Columbus. In a stroke of genius, he accurately predicted a lunar eclipse and thus convinced the terrified Arawak that he was a god. <laughs> but he went back to Spain in disgrace anyway, having failed to find enough gold. By the end of the 1520s, when Spain had conquered Mexico and Peru and turned its back on Jamaica. The Arawak tribe had already been exterminated by forced labor, starvation, and disease. Yet a few survived, escaping from the coastal plain up into the Blue Mountain, where no Spaniards followed them. When archaeologists dig in the remains of maroon encampment, they sometimes find shards of Arawak pottery shattered amid the iron and glass brought to the settlement by the African runaways. Just before Christmas, that first semester, I climbed 7,280 feet to the top of Blue Mountain with another history professor, Neville Hall. Our party camped halfway up the mountain and then rose three hours before dawn to reach the summit at sunrise. Climbing in darkness, we passed close through to the ruins of the Maroon village called Nanny Town for all of us to think about the warrior chieftainess for whom it is named. The sister of a compound squadron, legend has it that when the British bombarded Nani's settlement with cannons and guns, she took these missiles into her and fired them back. Panting uphill in the night air, you know, I'm not even going to say what she said she took the missiles into, you know, but it's definitely not what other people used to say. You understand? This woman has said she take them in her vagina and fire them back. Although she said it's a legend. You know, see, well, again, these legends propagate a myth. Like, as if the person wasn't real, because when certain things, how should you take cannon shot in her vagina and fire them back? Woman, wrong right in that, you know, the idiot thing. You know, see, this might not be considered and think about how you propagate and portray um, the, real, the reality that you came across in Jamaica back then. Yeah, so you know, you know, see, mm -hmm. kind of idiot thing that boy should take. Sure, you just come mess up the story with your lunacy, you come like some blagger. Sure, and fire them back. Panting up here in the cool night air, Neville and I saw torchlight flickering through the bush and a ridge above us. You know, see, Nanny goes up there. He asked in a whisper that brought goosebumps up on my arm. Although the archaeologists still dream of finding Nanny's gravesite, her maroon descendants say it will never be found because she never died. I thought of some children I had watched one night years before when Alex Haley's root, roots was on Jamaican television, playing Kunta Kente on the beach of a fishing village near Montego Bay. They reenacted the scene where Kunta is beaten to make him forget his African name. So taken with their play that the voices of their mothers calling them home to bed rang out unheeded across the beach. When the boy who played Kunta collapsed, collapsed on the, the sand, exhausted by the pretend beating, one child cried, Kunta dead, you fool. A little girl whispered, Kunta can't dead, him live forever. So if you ask a Jamaican where Nanny is buried, they will, they will know you have missed the point of her life. 
like most Americans, I began rising before dawn to catch the morning coolness. It was the best time to read papers and write lectures. The only sound were bird songs from the active groove and the distant shout of boys from the Poco Flats shanty town near the university. The Poco Flats shanty town near the university. They came across the dew soaked lawn with long sticks and crocus bags, knocked the ackee down, and then sold it at Papine Market. They also scavenged through the garbage dump next to my flat for food scraps and anything else that looked interesting. I had taken some photographs of a woman named Miss Addy who sold papayas at Papine, and after, and after giving her the good ones, I tossed the other pictures in the trash. When I went to Papine a few days later, Miss Haddy held up one of the crumpled grease stained photographs in an angry reproach. Why you think I let you take my picture for? She asked. You don't know somebody can fix your business like so. A poker flat boy who knew her had found the picture and returned it to her. Miss Haddy was sure that some obia man could have used it to fix her business to fix her business to wear black magic that Jamaicans call high science after that I caref I was careful about what I threw out there was no privacy even in trash the poker flash children were persistent beggars clanging up the aluminum louvers of my ground floor flat with a stick with a stick if I couldn't answer their first softly hissed request it was impossible for me to refuse them, even though Jamaicans commonly ignore beggars. I wrote about the children to an anthropologist friend who was then in Costa Rica doing research on a banana plantation. He was a Marxist, and I expected him to write back with an order not to give arms and thus start the coming of the revolution. But he was deep in his own terrible rever reversals by then. Keep giving, he wrote. Now that Reagan is in for a second term, we will probably all be giving to beggars for the rest of our lives. The boys from Poker Flats left the, the campus at dusk. Then the students from the dorm across the yard cranked up their boom boxes, full blasts, to study by. I got used to working with the accompaniment of heavy dance hall tunes, like the ones I had heard with Nelson on the drive from the airport. They were all full of gun sounds and DJs who spat out their lyrics with ballistic style. The current hit was by a group called Blood Fire Posse and the song was titled Every Posse Get Flat. I had to ask one of my students what a posse was. Well, she smiled. It's like your crew, your friends are a gang, you know? It comes from the Western. So, so what does get flat mean, I ask. It means to hit the floor when the shots start fire. Life on campus was full of ironies, most of which grew up of the contra contradiction between Jamaican's reality and the lovingly preserved illusion that Yui was like Oxford and Cambridge. Teaching was based on the tutorial system, perfectly suited to an English university where there is a surfeit of splendid libraries, well-prepared students, and an army of dance for one-on-one -on -one sessions of brilliant exchange. But this was Jamaica. My tutorials had 20 or 30 students each, and they were all supposed to read the same book from a meagre library and produce a weekly paper. They competed with, with other students for those books, like dogs scrapping for scarce bones. The reserves book had a way of disappearing or of coming out of the stacks with entire chapters ripped out by some desperate scholar. I was lucky if one of our two come to the meeting having read anything. No one could afford to buy the five paperbacks I had assigned for the American history course. They cost between 50 and 200 dollars each in Jamaica's IMF emasculated currency and that was 
double what my students spent for our food in a week. Many were women with children and they fed themselves last. They came to class exhausted and I learned not to be insulted if some those through lectures are didn't turn up for days at a time. The campus had its tribe of homeless people and half mad ground keepers. Ras Dizzy made the sound every day, made the rounds every day. A shadow of of the Rastafarian, who had once been a major Kingston artist. Dizzy had been beaten by the police so many times that he was deranged with justified paranoia. He would come by my office bringing scribbled poems about the fall of Babylon and primitive painting he did when he could scrape up enough money for our supplies. I'm going to the country, he vowed after a savage encounter with some rogue cops left him badly hurt. Judge can't live in this rascal city again. <clears throat> a crazy groundskeeper named Winston always came by my office on Friday afternoon to ask for a few dollars to buy his white room. He wore a blue felt officer's cap and a tattered wool tunic with gold buttons. Even in the blazing heat, it looked like the uniforms once worn by London bus conductors, but Winston carried it with military bearing. I served His Majesty in the late war, he proclaimed, brandishing his machete like an officer's baton and railing against cruel students who taunted him about his drinking. After every outburst, he would strain his tunic and shout, back to university and resume his work of hacking at the thorny Bougainvillea bushes. The mood in Kingston that fall was sober. Jamaica's foreign debt was then a massive $4 billion, the largest per capita in the world. <laughs> Siaga was rationalizing and reconstructing, restructuring the economy to service this debt further crippling a country already battered by the oil price shock of the 1970s. Translated into the terms of sufferers' existence, all the Prime Minister's fan fancy financial wizardry meant was hunger. The government dropped subsidies on essential foods like rice, cornmeal and flour. Prices soared as the International Monetary Fund repeatedly devalued Jamaica's dollar. Protein was just a dim memory. Aki and saltfish national dish became a delicacy when when salt fish went up to ten dollars a pound then twenty dollars then thirty dollars chicken fly to fly so high we only see the shadow moon barbara gluden the popular host of a radio calling show he's gone to banquet elsewhere clinics the hospitals around the island were forced to close as the healthcare system was rationalized and the same bitter IMF medicine was spooned down the throat of school teachers who went on strike. The Caribbean based initiative CBI, David Rockefeller's brainchild, was Seattle's post Grenada showpiece. The CBI was hyped as an economical boost, as an economic boost for the region. But its real purpose was to turn the island into offshore sweatshop where American manufacturers could exploit cheap labor. The program launched a string of garment factories on Kingston waterfront, and it used call it free zone. Non-union plants were where 10,000 women and girls, handpicked from Seattle's West Kingston constituency, worked for 20 cents an hour stitching Nike running shoes, Hanes Pantios, and Liz Clearbone's sportswear. God stripped the women at the end of every shift to make sure they weren't stealing garments, and Siaga's poor goons beat up any union organizers who tried to get inside the factories. But the women were grateful to have work. The CBI was also working miracles in the countryside. No foreign agribusiness firms could lease the best arable land and grow winter vegetable for export. These farms were high technology 
plantation with state of the art machinery and a barefooted workforce of laborers who migrated from one rural parish to another in search of jobs. I met a young Israeli at a party in Kingston who was an overseer at Spring Plain, an agro farm in the parish of Clarendon, and he invited me on a tour of the place. Hebrew-speaking masters roared across the irrigated field in fancy jeeps, yelling at the ragged laborers and complaining to me in English about the dirt of a work ethic among Jamaica. Guards patrol the field and shipping areas with high-powered weapons. A few weeks after I was there, a worker was shot to death for allegedly pilfering products produced. In, in the packing shed, cartons of perfectly sized and shaped zucchini, tomatoes and cucumbers were waiting to be flown to America and Europe, but Spring Plain nevertheless went bankrupt a year later, and the shady Israeli entrepreneur who had leased it vanished into thin air. The firm was rumored to have been a front for his cocaine trafficking. On the political front, Jamaica was eerily moribund a one-party state for the first time in 40 years. Manley and the PMP had boycotted a snap election called in 1983, just after the invasion of Grenada had raised his popularity in the poll. Manley's stated reason for the boycott was Seattle's unwillingness to bring the voters list up to date, but the real reason was that he knew he would lose. His refusal to contest the GLP left Jamaica without an opposition party in government. This one party rule brought out the worst of Siaga atrocities. Atro at autocratic tendencies. He took to announcing tough new policies and austerity measures like royal fiats. And then he spent an inordinate amount of time away from Jamaica with foreign dignitaries and the international money men who called the shots. His friends were Ronald Reagan and Eugenia Charles, the leader of Dominica who had mastered the Grenada invasion. Several of his ministers were close to the Duvalier regime in Haiti. None of this would have mattered had conditions in Jamaica not been so dire, but as things were, this closeness with wealthy and powerful right-wing allies to Jamaica's distress into stark relief. There was an ugly interlude when John Rollins, an American tycoon, tried to evict squatters from a stretch of prime oceanfront land he owned near Montego Bay. When lawyers defended the squatters' claims, Rollins went to his friends at Stibank and tried to convince them to freeze its loans to Jamaica until the government did his bidding. Jamaica was beginning to resemble Haiti, and some of Siaga's critics compared him to the De Valiers. Although he is white, there were echoes of De Valierism in Kingston's police, in Kingston's police, terror, and the way Siaga manipulated his black followers, turning up in West Kingston for dances in revivalist tabernacles and taking part in the dark ceremonies of Pocomania, a cult whose practitioners often double as Obia men. His spiritual mentor was a widely feared Pocomania shepherd named Malika Capo Reynolds, an intuitive painter and woodcarver whose work was installed in its own room of Kingston National Gallery. Capo had a reputation as a science man, a high priest of the dark arts. When Manley developed cancer in 1985, the word on the street was that Capo had followed Siaga's order to fix his rival business once and for all, and that Manley was therefore doomed. This atavistic return to superstition and occultism was paradoxical, paradoxically paired with a fresh passion for anything American and white. Dreadlocks, dashikis, and black pride went underground, replaced by a sinister longing for status and the trappings of privilege. Beauty pageants were big again, even though Manley and his elegant dark-skinned wife Beverly had tried in the 70s to discourage these contests because they invariably favored women with light skin and white features. 
Now they were back with a vengeance and all of the winning contestants were brown or tan. Black women flocked to, to watch models with narrow noses and good hair sashaying down and run down the runaway at luxury hotels like the Wyndham and the Pegasus. A Jamaica Miss Universe contestant named Ruth Kamok caused a scandal when she sued her dryer deodorant sponsors after they pulled her from the pageant because she was too dark. You should learn to face reality, they told her. Naturally, we prefer a person with lighter skin and taller hair. Althea Leng, Miss Jamaica fashion model of 1985, admitted that she was a rarity among beauty queens. They are calling me the black statement, she said, because Jamaica is into the brown thing. A woman fitting, fittingly named Grace Virtue wrote a letter to the Gleaner about the Ruth Kemmock affair, 150 years after emancipation. We quote Marcus Garvey and sing Bob Marley's song, and sing Bob's song, but for the majority of us, beauty does not exist unless it comes decked in garb of a fair skin and straight hair. I say black was never beautiful for, I, I say black was never beautiful. For a fleeting moment in the 1970s, it seems as if we were finally accepting, our, accepting ourselves. But this absurd seems to have taken a nosedive. Arthur Rex Netterford, one of the island's most gifted and prolific critics of its racial schizophrenia, lamented the resurgence of beauty pageants and the spectacle of combatants locked in covert and overt conflict as to the true worth of that melanin which reside obstinately in the skins of the vast majority. Yes, sir, it's a grand, you know? Jamaican women, like, like, like their sisters everywhere, were the, the, minis, the miners, canaries for their country's poison air. Super cat, the undisputed don of dancer, came out with a hit song called Boots, about the way ghetto girls had to find a sugar daddy if they wanted to eat. Boopsism became the talk of the town, a code word for female despair. Kingston men lost a champion of promiscuity when a man named Charlie Machas died in his 90s. Charlie had fathered 48 children with different women and some with proposed and some with pro proposed a fund in his honor to reward men who still who sell at least 20 children with 10 or more women. Mike Henry, the Minister of Culture, didn't think the proposal was funny at all and he struck back with a nasty speech about how poverty was just a disease brought on by excessive breeding. Another expert on the population problem said that the poor with too many children simply had nothing better to do. But it took courage to do it in Kingston. Women labored three to a bed at Jubilee lying in. If they could get to the childbirth clinic throughout the night, the barrage of gunfire that prepared the street, that peppered the streets around Kingston Public Hospital. The hospital was dangerously close to the border between the JLP's West Kingston stronghold and the PMP's concrete jungle garrison gunmen that recently murdered a hospital porter and torched two of the wards then killed a policeman and his girlfriend. She was in labor at the time, and he was trying to get her to Jubilee. Winston Spalding, the JLP's Minister of National Security, blamed the killing on the concrete jungle gang. The PMP blamed Steaga and his thugs from Tivoli. Everyone thought the crime wave in Kingston couldn't get any worse, but it did. Dealing with it had transformed the police force from a British inspired constabulary into a tribe of killers in uniform. By the time I moved to Kingston, they were committing a staggering one-third of the island's homicide. Americans watch, Americans watch sent a mission to Jamaica in, to investigate police brutality and condemned the force for shooting criminal suspects along with innocent bystanders on site. Maurice Cargill, the Gleaners, Homogen columnist 
responded to the America's Watch report by admitting that the police do shoot down known murderers and armed gangsters when they captured, sometimes in cold blood. This is not the best way of justice. But in our present circumstance, my only complaint is that they don't shoot enough of them. The deadliest member of the police force was a killer cop named Keith Gardner, who earned the nickname Trinity from a spaghetti western. He became famous in the 1970s for walking his prisoners at gunpoint from one lockup to another, like some Wild West llama. He used to show up at downtown dances with a brace of pistols and an M16, just all in black like a gunfighter. Trinity learned badmanism from the inside growing up in concrete jungle and then rising through the police force to become Siaga's bodyguard for the 1980 election campaign. His closeness with the Prime Minister allowed him to rub shoulders with celebrities and the walls of his office at the halfway tree police station were decorated with frame colored photographs of him with Nelson Mandela, Jesse Jackson and Queen Elizabeth. Trinity reckoned that he had been in a total of 97 shootouts but he modestly claimed not to be counting anymore. I think the moment you start counting, you are becoming degenerate, he told me once in a voice so soft that I had to lean forward to catch his words above the hum of the air, condition, the air conditioner in his office. You might think like a criminal, but you do not necessarily learn to behave like them. Like them. A few years later, Trinity shot and killed his wife in a domestic quarrel and then became a, nun, became a born again Christian. It was thought that perhaps he had claimed he had calmed down somewhat, but his colleagues and the force were still as deadly as ever. A few months after I arrived in Kingston, some rogue cops executed a university graduate, Patrick Lewis. He was riding with some friends in a stolen car on a Red Hills Road, on Red Hills Road, uptown, when the cops ambushed the car and shot him in cold blood. Lewis was a veteran leftist with ties to both the PNP and the Workers' Party of Jamaica, the Island Communist Party. According to press report of his death, that was enough to warrant his execution in this new Jamaica. But most of the other police homicides were random killings with no political motive. They killed a shoemaker in the parish of St. Thomas as a man sat under a tambourine tree with some friends. The first shot didn't kill him, and when he begged for his life, one of the cops laughed. Now you're dead, boy. I'm going to kill you, he said. The police didn't like to leave witness. A few weeks later, they picked up a 17-year-old Kingston schoolboy named Garfield Chin, and shot him once. After they found a Bible and a letter from his girlfriend in Chin's pocket, they teased him about the romance and then stuffed him in their squad car chunk. Chin begged for mercy. You attack? One cop asked. Then he fired a single shot into Chin's head. There were usually one or two stories like these in the Gleaner every day. I would clip them in the evening after work and slide them into a fattening filed mark, police killing. 57 people died in the first two months of 1987. 29 of them were killed by cops. Soon I had a Miss, Miss Calenius file I couldn't name, so I called it Distress Signal. Some of the stories recounted weird events in the Paris outside Kingston. Some were about cannibalism. A man said to be of unsound mind was beaten to death by citizens in Ashton District, Westmoreland, on Saturday after he was found eating what was believed to be the remains of a man chopped in two. Some were about madmen who were stoned or beaten to death by mobs are about the mentally ill who were treated like criminals. The file also held stories about crop theft, crop theft and what country people did to the thieves.
I clipped the story of a 12 year old schoolboy named Miguel Miller who hanged himself after he failed his common entrance admission exam for high school. Even if he had passed, the odds still would have been against him. High school had space for only one fourth of the 40,000 children who took the common entrance every year. I clipped a lot of stories about ganja and cocaine as the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, funded ganja eradication mission led by the Jamaica Defense Force. Greener ran daily cautionary tales about the hapless farmers who, whose fields had gone up in smoke. Meanwhile, here Jamaica planes were getting impounded in Miami and New York with huge quantities of weed in their cargo bay. But ganja was an old story. The presence of cocaine was new. It was news when a shipment was seized from some pleasure boat off Jamaica. Or when a fisherman found a stray kilo bopping on the waves after the rest of the shipment was picked up at sea. None of these random articles told the story of the full story of Jamaica's tragic mating dance with cocaine how it first appeared during the 1980 election campaign when Siaga's gunmen were the ones who used and peddled it, how most of the drug came into Kingston's Newport West Wars in shipping containers and that it was no coincidence that those wars were controlled by the JLP, how cocaine's have turned Siaga's mercenaries into madmen and, too late, shown the politician wireless that they had created monsters they could no longer control. But cocaine was not the only contraband that was coming into Newport West. The Gleaner ran a screaming headline on October 4, 1984. Arms cachet. FBI Interpol called in. The story said that two 55-gallon steel drum had mysteriously shown up on the wire. It did not mention that the custom officer who had being bribed to clear them having to be off that day. When another worker opened the barrel, he found a 22, he found a 22 gun arsenal that included an M16 and M1 M4, five assault rifles, two 44 Magnum, and more than 6,000 rounds of ammunition. The Gleaner dropped the story after that. But for American authorities, it was only the beginning. Federal agents from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearm traced the gun to a string of pawn shops in Florida, Dade, and Broward County. They were part of a much larger cache. 210 weapons brought in Florida and Ohio by a posse called the Shower. Spawned in Tivoli Garden, the Shower had been running things for Seattle since the 1980s election. But by 1984, it had moved into base of operations. It has moved its base of operations to Florida. And its two leaders, Vivian Blake and Lester Jim Brown Coke, were running ganja and cocaine from Miami to New York. Jim Brown, who had taken his nickname from the American football star, <laughs> had only just left Kingston when I arrived. He had killed so many people for the JP in 1980 that he became the undisputed Dan Gada, Dan Dada of the street. And his deadly reputation was reaffirmed in May 1984 when he went into Kingston's ghetto with 20 shower men and killed 12 people in a single night of terror. He left the island soon after that and promptly sent those 22 guns down from Miami to his friends in Tivoli Garden. A month after the shipment was intercepted, Brown was robbed outside a drug house in Miami where he had just brought some cocaine. He thought the people inside had set him up, so he went back and killed everyone there. To make certain that all six were dead, he went through the house and finished each one of them with a bullet to the head. It took another three years for a Miami police to figure out who Jim Brown was and to link him to the 1984 slayings. By then, the shower had become the deadliest posse in the United States. 
I was years away from knowing any of this when I read the Gleaner's Gun Cache headline that October morning. But it seemed even then that even then to be an ominous sign of further trouble. Although I was beginning to see that Jamaicans are expert at coping with duress that would spark an armed insurrection anywhere else in the world. I kept expecting the lid to blow off as I watched the violence and suffocation escalate in Kingston. Pressure, pressure drop was what the reggae singer Tootsie Bird had called it years before, but now it seems at, as if that pressure was becoming unbearable. The lid did blow off in early January 1985 when Siaga announced in an evening speech to Parliament that the price of gasoline was shooting up to $11 a gallon. We knew this meant steep increase in the cost of everything else. Siaga acknowledged the pain that you all feel, but he said that the IMF's impending devaluation of Jamaican dollar necessitates the increase and that as a result, a favorable exchange rate for America's tourism would enjoy its best season ever. 400 million Jamaican dollars in earnings. So no one was supposed to complain. Roadblocks were going up across the island before Siaga had finished his speech. By morning, Kingston Street were full of angry crowds clustered at intersection, blocked by fallen trees burning tires and the husk of blackened cars. Some of the barricades were like neighborhood black parties, small spontaneous combustions of protests. But the ones in PMP strongholds turned deadly when the PNP sent its goons into the street to quell the demonstration. Gunmen from Warika showed up with their arsenal. Three people were shot dead by police in Nanivet, a PNP area and others were killed on the Winward Road. Manley disclaimed any party connection with the violence and said Jamaicans had simply reached the limit of their capacity to endure hardship and suffer in silence. Seattle left the island for Miami to appear on the McNeil Leather News Hour and reassured the frightened American tourists that Jamaica was still a safe destination. It was the height of the winter season and rioting on the island was Siaga's worst nightmare come true. American television crew got into Kingston in time to send back scary footage of shooting mobs and burning barricades, making Jamaica look like a miniature South Africa. When islanders learned that their leaders had skipped out to the mainland to parley with the people who really mattered, <laughs> they got even angrier. Classes were suspended at UWE and the campus was dead quiet except for the sound of radios. No one wanted to sample the action of League and the Roadblock nearby. When I, when I tipsed across the land to check on Never Hall, the adventurous colleague who, who, who had taken me up Blue Mountain a few weeks before, he flatly refused to accompany me to Ligani. I had enough excitement in 1980, he said. If you want to check out this latest manifestation of our collective unrest, you will have to go by yourself. But Trevor Monroe, a government professor and leader of the Workers' Party of Jamaica, rallied some students for a march down to Mona Road. Monroe was fearless. He would had his skull cracked many times in the 1970s when he worked as a WPJ organizer on the, Kings, on the West Kingston docks. So an uptown roadblock was a picnic by comparison. One of his students had a boombox and was playing the latest song by Trinidad's reigning Calypsonia, The Mighty Sparrow. It was called Capitalism Gone Mad. <laughs> Perfect music for the barricades. The sufferers of Ligani were in a celebratory mood. Even when Trinity careened up in a police jeep and began threatening the crowd, he and Trevor Manuel got into a brief, intense shouting match, but the professor stood his ground and Trinity left. Fortified by the rhythms of the mighty sparrow, we watched as more jeeps full of soldiers and police tried to dismantle the roadblock. 
turning back when the sufferers dragged the more debris from a stockpile in someone's yard. A helicopter from the Jamaica Defense Force hovered so low over the crowd that I could see the pilot's face. He was laughing. Soldier boy, them feeling the pressure same as we, said the grey-haired man beside me. Them nang go shoot at we today. The raiders told us that in other parts of Kingston there was plenty of shooting going on, but no one wanted to surrender this chance to fight back. I recognized people I knew in the crowd, a few of my students, the buxom Higgler woman who sold fruits and vegetables every day at Ligany, and the pushcart man who sold jelly coconuts in the shades. Since there was no produce coming into town, the Higglers were celebrating their day off, flinging raucous good-natured insult at one another and instead of sitting on their scraps of cardboard in the burning sun and haggling over the pieces over the price of mangoes <laughs> there was a rasta woman named plummy who always had the best produce and she was at the roadblock in her sunday best just in a patchwork skirt of red gold and green with her replacement locks tied into a towering with a resplendent locks tied into a towering head wrap. She was brandishing a big unlit spliff that gestured to the freedom of the moment. Whoa, daughter, from a beam, tapping me on the back in sisterly greeting. What a day we live to see, eh? Looking like the big men them get a liquor of their own back at last. The, the gas price riot as the press called them, lasted for three days. But by the evening of the second day, Kingston Street were clear enough to drive. So I went down to the Pegasus Hotel in New Kingston, the city's business district, to see how the foreign journalists who always stayed there was faring. They were sitting in rattan chairs by the pool, trading stories and trying to straighten out the details of the island's political scene. Jamaica had not been on anyone's list of stories worth covering since 1980, so the riots had caught the media by surprise. But Siaga's silky voice, all female public relations team, was at the Pegasus, urging the journalists to leave Kingston and write some positive stories from under a palm tree in Nigel. The government had chartered several small planes to take them there. One of the women mistook me for a correspondent and began her pitch. It is essential to our government that you pay you play down the extent of these disturbances, she said. If more scenes of violence and disorder make it into the American media, it will be disastrous for our tourism. She spoke with dignity and composure, but I felt ashamed for the position she was in. The riots changed nothing, of course. When the streets were cleared and the country returned to normal, gasoline was selling for the promised $11 a gallon and the cost of living went up one more notch. The sufferers were still drinking salt water to fill their bellies and Siaga was still firming, firmly in control. When classes resumed, some of my students wanted to talk about the protests, but others were anxious, others were anxious about expressing their views. The current regime had impressed them with the importance of pleasing Americans, and only a few dared to risk offending a teacher whose country held their hostage, held theirs hostage. So there were a lot of embarrassed apologies for the recent bad behavior. But the brightness of my students, a woman who later won a Fulbright scholarship to John Hoskins to John Hopkins and became a historian herself, wasn't apologizing for anything. She was furious and her eyes sparkled with, with tears. You know what offended me the most? She said, her voice quaking. Siaga just ignored us. He went and talked to the Americans, told them it was still safe years for them. What about us? Whose country is this anyway? You know? Yeah, yo, that's at the end of chapter two.
almost one and a half hours of reading. Hey, I hope you will not watch it till yes, you know. See if you don't watch it till yes, so just 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 comment a yes, so. <laughs> if you don't watch it till yes, so just comment a yes, so. You'll see it on the next reading. Anybody will comment yes, so. I call your name in the reading stream. You see it. I know me can. I have a couple of people that already have a note. I go comment them. Yeah, so. You know, see it. Yeah, man. Yeah, very interesting and um, exciting. You know, see it. Read, swing and read one and a half hour to one. You don't know. You don't know. You, you, you not take nothing because it's, 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 it's so informative. I would have done it for myself on my own. So you don't know doing it with this like company. Anyway, I don't keep on much longer with my ramblings. You know, see it because. The next chapter name Brambles. So we're not gonna keep on no longer with no way for rambles. You see? So more blessed. Share like and subscribe in a Rastafari name. And all things that's good. See? Big up yourself, Serena Atkins.